Can you please state your name and say where we are? Uh, my name is Shane Karimi and we're at the University of San Diego. And can you begin by saying something that you're passionate about? I'm actually passionate about my own um, social venture I've started this year. It's called Project Doable. And it's actually basically, it's a platform website, um, much like a Craigslist or a Match.com for dating, Facebook, you name it. Many of those social media ventures that have started up in the last couple of years. Um, the only primary difference is that, in my opinion, a platform like this does not exist. Um, what we seek to do at Project Doable is really to connect community needs directly to the stakeholders that can actually solve the problems. So basically problems to solutions, in other words. Um, a quick example that would kind of help is, um, you know, there's social issues all over the world, right? There's world hunger, there's infant mortality. Those are social issues. The difference between a social issue and a case study is that in a case study, which is what we're going to be gathering, it's specific, it's tangible, and it's localized to one community. So, um, for instance, if I say in Omo, Ethiopia, there's infant mortality because it's really cold at night and women can't afford incubators. That's a case study because it's tangible and it may have a market solution. So my job is to gather as many diverse case studies as possible in different categories, um, environment, communication, technology, you name it. Um, and then we basically seek the market solution to that. Um, now, if I were to say there's infant mortality in the world, that's a social problem, right? And it's very difficult to tackle and it's not tangible. So the difference in what we do is we pretty much, um, we utilize our networks that have already been established. Um, I worked for the United Nations before. I worked for the American Red Cross for four years, did disaster management work. Um, and I basically feel that I really have an understanding of how communities work, how those sort of impromptu leadership characters come up, NGOs, nonprofits, all those players that people don't really know about unless they're in that community. Um, my trick is that I know how to access those folks and how to get them to understand that this is, this is a complement to what you do. It's not a supplement, right? Um, there's many charities out there, and we love them, but that's a separate movement, right? So once we gather those case studies, um, of whatever situation that nonprofit or NGO or individual is working on, we then elicit the solution. Um, that's kind of my favorite part. That's basically where we look into um, whether it's a company, a business, an innovative thinker who's come up with something that can basically be a solution to that. So if we take the infant um, you know, mortality situation, if a baby is dying because it's too cold, well, you know, basically there could be a, an insulating baby jacket that keeps the baby warm for three days. In fact, that does exist. Um, I believe the name of a co-founder of the company is Michelle Chen, or the founder. Right, uh, you probably heard about her. Yeah. And the company is Embrace. Um, now, if this company had existed back when Michelle, you know, um, came up with her idea, she would probably perhaps register her issue as a case study, and then we would have all those companies, you know, registered, and then we'd match them up. She happened to be somebody who actually started an entire company based on that premise. But not everybody needs to start a company to solve an issue. Sometimes you just know enough to basically address that problem. Um, so again, you have issues being stated in case studies, and then you have companies, individuals who have the solutions. Um, the other thing is I volunteered um, as a graduate student member of the Center for Peace and Commerce here when I was here. And we have a lot of um, understanding and access of how the innovative business world works, right? Innovative social innovation and um, just a lot of folks who do a lot that most people don't know about unless they're in the industry. Um, it is a growing industry, so the idea is to kind of get all these folks together, and Project Doable is the way to do that. It's to basically creating an ecosystem for those who have the solutions, those that have the problems. And sometimes, um, I know I've gotten this question, well, what if they can't afford the solutions you come up with? What if you find solutions and they can't afford $20 baby jackets? That's still cheaper than $600 incubator, but it's still $20. So in those cases, um, we would actually find third-party funders. There's a lot of grant um, institutes and you know um, individuals who are willing to fund such things. So it really does create an ecosystem. It's about basically channeling resources properly. Um, and then, of course, there's always surplus resources that companies want to donate, and that's OK, too. But again, totally separate um, piece of Project Doable. It's just basically a system, and we think it's doable. That's why it's called Project Doable. Um, it is an optimistic way to look at how people can come together and unite and basically just coordinate on resources. Um, and it also is a market solution, so that's where the sustainability comes in. Um, you know, we're not handing anything out. We're just basically addressing um, solutions in a much more tangible way than before. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs>
Well, thank you for sharing some of that. Um, can you talk about a character strength in yourself that you see has kind of come through throughout this experience? Yeah, I think I've um, realized that I'm very patient um, and I'm very understanding. So, you know, again, working with so many different stakeholders in the initiation of this project, I'm realizing some will, um, you know, basically come forward and almost do the work for you, right? Others, they need a little bit more coaxing. So I've learned that the biggest strength I have in me is is sort of that positive patience. I don't lose, just if, if someone doesn't contact me right away, that's okay, they're working on their schedule. Doesn't mean they're not passionate, doesn't mean they're not committed. Everyone has different levels of motivation. So I've kind of learned how to tap into that and I think that that's a strength I didn't really know I had. Um, so yeah. <laughs> that's fantastic. And then my final question is, if you had a piece of advice, maybe stuff that you've learned throughout pursuing this new passion, or just throughout your life experience, um, what would that be for others, just advice on? I think any time you pursue something um, that's not 100% risk adverse, you just kind of have to sign that little waiver saying, I'm just gonna do this, right? Um, I think I am in a situation, you know, I've graduated um, um, my, with my master's degree and I, Mostly what you do in that situation is you think, okay, I have loans, right? I have to jump into the real world, get a job. Well, yeah, that's, a, that's always an avenue. But to start your own venture, if you have your own vision, if you want to take a big jump, you kind of just have to jump. And it's so hard to say that because even to myself, um, I had a month or two where I kind of sat on my idea, right? I contemplated, I overthought it. But there really is no trick to it except just go. Just like Nike says, just do it. And unless you take that jump, it sort of just seems, it's like there's no shortcuts, you know, there's no formula that's gonna make you feel safer. And I think I've realized that I'm just a little less fearful, even though the fear is still there, I'm kind of like, okay, I'm just gonna accept you there. You know, I haven't succeeded yet, you know, so it's not that anything has changed, but my mentality about it has changed. And I feel like as long as I don't give up and as long as I'm pragmatic and I adapt, that this will definitely, Project Doable will be doable. <laughs> Thank you.